I signed up to do this talk about six months ago, full of optimism, positive, and I was going to give you a message of hope. And, and then Brexit happened. I live in London, and I went、uh, into a period of depression, like many people, and was rethinking、uh, my, my attitude and my views. But I got over it, and my classic optimism returned. And I was looking forward for the last couple of weeks to celebrating the election of the first woman president of the United States. You know, she did get the most votes. I hope you realize that, if it's any consolation. And she probably would have got more had it not been for a number of measures that were taken in some parts of the United States to prevent black people and other minorities from voting. But I feel here today a little bit like someone trying to. Tell you the story and sell you on the idea of global warming in the middle of a winter storm. We are in a difficult period for human rights. What the Brexit and the recent US election and other events elsewhere in the world have done is fanned the embers, the smoldering embers of racism and xenophobia, and they are making life very hard, particularly for minorities here. In North America and elsewhere in the world. But my message is ultimately one of optimism because it involves taking the long view. I'm looking back 50 years and I'm looking forward 50 years. 50 years ago, the major human rights treaties, the two most important treaties in the United Nations, were adopted. We call them the covenants. They're related to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is a little older. And that began a very, very robust, complex, elaborate system that continues to grow that protects our human rights through the United Nations and through regional organizations. And, and of course, here in Europe, we are very fortunate to have what is perhaps the jewel of them all, which is the European Court of Human Rights. Only a few months ago, the European Court of Human Rights issued an important judgment against Switzerland. Although it wasn't really directed against Switzerland, it was directed against the United Nations Security Council for the first time. And it said that the United Nations Security Council, through its resolutions, which had to be enforced in Switzerland, was violating fundamental rights of due process and of equality before the law. I don't want to talk about the institutions and the structures and the documents. I want to talk about the ideas behind human rights and how they have evolved until today. To enable me, in a way, to project the future, to look forward. So, I want to go back 50 years and look at some of the issues that have, I think, surprised us in terms of how they emerged. One of them that I've worked on a great deal is the abolition of capital punishment. Now, 50 years ago, most countries in the world had the death penalty and used it, most of them. About 90% of states in the world used it. When the United Nations Secretary General was asked, is there a trend towards abolition? The Secretary General said, I can't tell one way or another. There doesn't appear to be a trend. But trend there is. And every year, for the last 30 years or so, two to three countries abolish the death penalty. And we're now in a situation where about 160 countries have abolished the death penalty, have stopped using it. Have changed their laws. Some, most of them have actually adopted international treaties to prevent the restoration of the death penalty. And there are fewer than 40 states that still use it. And in those 40 states, actually fewer than that, more like 37, the numbers are declining. There's less and less death penalty being used in most of them, even in the United States, where the death penalty was once thriving. It has been in Quite dramatic decline for the last decade or so, and the numbers continue to drop. And that's largely because juries, ordinary people, the, the same people who voted earlier this week, are the ones involved in taking the decisions. And I'm not talking about the voters in the blue states, in New York and Massachusetts and Vermont, because they don't have the death penalty there. We're talking about the voters in the South. And they are increasingly reluctant to sentence people to death. When I look into the future, 50 years from now, I'm convinced it'll be gone. We're just, those states are ticking themselves, knocking themselves off the list every year. Will it take 10 years or 20 years or 30 years? I'm not sure, but 50 years from now, it's over. 
And that could not have been foreseen or anticipated, I think, in 1966. I think if someone said that in 1966, people would have said, you know, what were you smoking this morning? Okay. Let me turn to another area of rights that I want to examine and, and develop, and that's equality rights. Actually, the equality rights go back much further. They go back to the, what's really the beginnings of modern human rights, which is the revolutionary developments of the 18th century, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and similar events. Those are the two big ones. And in the Declaration of Independence, which starts the American Revolution, they say all men are created equal. And we have something similar. It's like the first article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's actually based on it. It says that all uh, men are born free and equal in uh, freedom and in rights. That's the French Declaration. And the only difference between that and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is we now say all human beings. Because the women who were involved in drafting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights said, you're not going to say all men are born free and equal. But those who drafted these ideas, who, who conceived of them back in the 18th century, had blind spots. They understood the notion of equality, and they promoted it. But some of them were slave owners, and there was certainly no place for women in their vision of a free and equal society. They'd understood the principle, but they hadn't followed through the logic of it. And that's something that we see, and that I believe we'll continue to see. If I go back 50 years now, to 1966. We still had formally, officially racist states in, in the world, South Africa being the most important one, and in 1966 there was no end in sight. They just put Nelson Mandela in jail and he did about 30 years, almost 30 years in, in prison. In the United States they were just cleaning up their legislation, getting rid of the final remnants of law that promoted racial discrimination. The problems aren't solved, but they were they were just in the course of doing that in 1966. And when we turn to women's equality, I looked at the number of women uh, heads of government in the 1960s. Do you know, from 1960 to 1970, in the world, there were three women who were heads of government. And it improved in the next decade, from 1970 to 1980, there were four. And do you know how many there were in the last decade, from 2007? to 2016, 37 women heads of government. So there have been dramatic changes. I probably don't need to tell that to anybody in the room. I think you understand it. If you have any doubts, talk to your grandmothers, and they'll tell you how it changed. But the other thing about equality is that groups that were not contemplated in 1966, that were not discussed, that people didn't consider were part of the conversation about equality, have emerged more recently. Sexual minorities, for one. In 1966, most countries in the world, including many of them in Europe, criminalized gay sexual activity. Now, that's all gone. That's a thing of the past, uh, certainly in this part of the world. And now we have same-sex marriage. But, you know, in 1966, there were laws in the United States preventing marriage, not between people of the same sex, between people of different races. There were laws still in force 50 years ago. So who could have foreseen this? It's a bit like the death penalty. What person in 1966 would have said, 50 years from now, we'll have gay marriage. We'll have equality recognized for sexual minorities. Another area where there was huge development was in the area of uh, disability rights. And again, in 1966, disability rights were not really on the radar. And now we have a very, very uh, strong system. We have an international treaty. We have a great deal of attention being devoted to making sure that people who are disabled are in a position to play a full and equal role in our society, in our social life. And that's a great change that could not have been, I think, really foreseen in 1966. So the question is, what happens in the next 50 years? Where do we go in the next 50 years? I think in the area of equality rights, to remain with that very important core issue in human rights, the new frontier, the area that we have not addressed, is equality in economic and social rights, economic and social status. We have huge inequalities on this planet, even here in this country. They appear to have grown in many ways, and very unfortunately, these economic and social inequalities are also nourishing 
things like the populist movements that seem to be arising in different parts of the world and that are threatening human rights. And yet they seem to be what the, what the victims of these, of these violations turn to as a hope in order to enhance their desire for equal treatment. How this will come about in the next 50 years, I'm not in a position to say. We will have to find creative solutions. The fact is that the wealth has never been more unequally distributed in the world. Stephen Piketty wrote a great book about this a few years ago, and I'm sure many of you have read this. I think that on the planet Earth, there's enough wealth to ensure that every single person on the planet is fed and housed and educated and has medical care. But so much of it is hidden away in tax shelters in Panama, and we have to solve that problem. And I'm confident that we will. The other area, and this is something that uh, is in a way a newer right, is the right to freedom of movement. Now, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Covenant of 1966 says everyone shall have freedom of movement within their country, within the borders of their country. That was a political concession. It's like the slaveholders recognizing equality rights. Because if you think of the notion of freedom of movement, we should have freedom of movement throughout the earth without having to worry about borders. For most of us, actually, we probably assume we have it already. As, as prosperous European professionals, um, we are in a position to go out to the airport and fly anywhere in the world. All we need is a passport and a credit card, and we can do it. We assume we have these mobility rights, but there are people watching this elsewhere in the world, and they're saying, well, I don't have that. And that's the problem we have to correct. We have gone through this terrible crisis in Europe that people sometimes call the refugee crisis, with a million people trying to enter the continent. Some countries have been very welcoming. Some have been not so nice. What is it? It's people trying to exercise their right to freedom of movement. And another important right, their fundamental right, this is also secured in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, to seek asylum and to enjoy asylum from persecution. And it's to our shame as Europeans that thousands of them have died in recent years, drowned in the Mediterranean Sea, doing nothing more than trying to exercise their fundamental rights. Some think the solution is to build walls. That was an issue in the recent election campaign in the United States. Build a wall, that's going to advance humanity. You know, we had a wall in Europe once, not that long ago. Just over 50 years ago, somebody in East Germany thought it would be a good idea to build a wall. And that wall came crumbling down. We celebrated the anniversary again this week. That wall came crumbling down, and with it, the people who had built it. Okay? Humanity doesn't need more walls. We need bridges, not walls. Now, some of you are sitting there thinking, oh, he's a utopian, he's naive, these things will never come to pass. But imagine someone in 1966 talking about near universal ab abolition of the death penalty, equality for sexual minorities, the rights of the disabled, and so on. These two seemed unimaginable. If you call me a dreamer, let me cite another dreamer, Martin Luther King, who said that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it tends towards justice. I won't be around in 50 years to see whether my predictions come true. Most of you will be pretty old. I dare say you'll be sitting there thinking, that guy I heard in Zurich 50 years ago, did he underestimate things? Was he conservative? He never imagined how much things would change. The fact is, these ideas, freedom, equality, justice, they don't explain everything about the progress of humanity, about our ability to live together, but they explain a great deal, and they provide us with a guide to what our future is going to look like. Thank you. <laughs>